history has proved that the success of Redstone Arsenal in Huntsville, Alabama would depend on several factors. While the city of Huntsville had desegregated public facilities in 1962 and integrated public schools beginning in 1963, the city's federal installations at Redstone Arsenal and Marshall Space Flight Center needed to address the problems of equal employment opportunities beginning in the mid-1960s. This task would require strong leadership, a working relationship with Alabama A&M University in neighboring Normal, Alabama, and most importantly, a shift in culture. Redstone Arsenal retirees Leroy Daniels and John Nelson recount the events about their work to further equal employment opportunities at Redstone Arsenal beginning in the 1960s that would change the city of Huntsville forever. Interviewed by Kelly Hamlin and Bobby Bradley, filmed at the Sparkman Center on Redstone Arsenal in Huntsville, Alabama on May 2, 2018, this is their story. And we're excited to be here today on May 2nd of 2018 with Mr. Leroy Daniels and John Nelson and Mrs. Bobby Bradley, who's helping me take an interview from these men and record some of their important roles here at Redstone Arsenal historically, and what, uh, how they helped shape the direction of, of Huntsville's history and, and our national history. So first, I want to thank you gentlemen for taking the time to be with us today means a lot to us and you're helping us do something that's going to be meaningful for future generations too. So to start out with, we'd like to know some of your background prior to when you came here to Redstone. Uh, can you tell us some about whether you had grown up here in Huntsville or if you came from elsewhere like so many other people did to come work in Huntsville? No, I, I was born in Troy, Alabama. I grew up in Troy. And I came to Huntsville the first time uh, as a student um, on a field trip to the high school in Decatur. Hmm. Um, and because of the segregated uh, conditions in Alabama at that time, uh, I stayed on the campus of Alabama a and College, now University. And I walked the campus that evening uh, and into the night and early the next morning. And because of my medical asthmatic conditions, I just felt so relieved and, 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 and such relief that I could breathe out there on that hillside. It's a beautiful campus. <laughs> and, and, and I, I just felt so relieved just to breathe that I went back home and I said to my mother, my father had gone to the barbershop, I said to my mother, I found it. I found it. I found a place where I'm going to college. Uh, it, I, can, I can breathe that. So that's how I came hmm. to Huntsville. And I, and I had the idea that that was where I was going to stay. Uh, so two years later, uh, I came back to, to Huntsville. Actually, I would call it normal because uh, that's the name of, of the hillside. Mm -hmm. Alabama a and College, Normal, Alabama. And so you went to college there at A&M? That's right. And then uh, did you get hired to Redstone immediately from? No, no. I went back home to, to Troy, Alabama. And I, I thought I might become a teacher. Uh, and there was a vacancy at my high school for a history teacher, my major in college. Uh, However, the, prin the principal wanted me to become a basketball coach and wanted the basketball coach to become the history teacher. 
and that didn't work out so well. <laughs> so through several uh, actions, I wound up in Huntsville by way of Tuskegee Institute's Counselor Advisory University Summer Education, and it sent me on a on a, 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 a training exercise to the State Employment Office in Huntsville, Alabama, and I spent two months there, and then I was unemployed. And a Trojan, uh, Mr. and then a later was to become Dr. Mingo Clark called me one day and said, a hey, Mr. Luther Adams is looking to hire somebody at Redstone and I have given him your name. Call him. And I called him and he asked me to come see him. And I found my way to Redstone Arsenal for an interview with Mr. Luther Adams, who at that time was the Deputy Civilian Personnel Officer at Redstone Arsenal. And we talked, and he asked me to come to work on an emergency appointment, a 30-day emergency appointment uh, as a GS-5 personnel specialist and and I worked for that 30 days that uh, at that time take the federal service entrance exam and didn't pass it during the first 30 days so he said well we can extend it for another 30 days and uh, I took it again took that exam again didn't pass it I said well well so I took the personnel clerk exam, and I passed that one. So I, I became a personnel clerk, GS4. And I was doing fairly well. Became the program coordinator for the summer program. And I was doing fairly well, and, and I received another notice. This one from the United States Military Service. <laughs> Report, report to Montgomery. Vietnam. Report to Montgomery. <laughs> you, are, you are hereby. Uh, you have you have been selected for military service. And I left my job at Redstone and reported for military duty. And what year was that? That was March 1966. Mm -hmm. Came back to Redstone at uh, the 1st of April, 1968. And, and, and I started again to take the Federal Service Entrance Exam. And through a series of taking it and failing it and taking it and failing it, finally I passed it and, and got a chance to to become a, what was known as a local intern. And, and from that, oh, I start making progress. Well, I'm gonna stop you there and we'll have John Nelson catch up with you in time. And so John, can you tell us about your life before you ended up at Redstone? Well, Leroy and I um, got here a different route, but uh, after getting here together in 66, <clears throat> our Careers parallel and were intertwined, but I um, I'm born in Pul I was born in Pulaski, Tennessee, Giles County, matter of fact, um, on a farm right out of Pulaski. So different Leroy, he's a city boy. I'm a country boy. <laughs> um, even went to school in a one-room school, country school, for eight years. But after graduating from high school in '55, I went to um, Tennessee A and I at the time, Tennessee State now. Um, I interrupted my uh, college days by going to the military in 58, came back in 63 and graduated in 64 uh, with a degree in biology. I was hired then at Vanderbilt University to be a 
research technician in their laboratory there. <clears throat> in the six or seven months after that, I got a call from a good friend of mine, uh, Claude Martin, who died recently, and he told me that uh, this was uh, in 66. He told me that Redstone was interested in hiring some young blacks and that uh, Claude was my homeboy. So he was, wanted me to come down and take an interview, again with Luther Adams. And after interviewing, uh, Luther thought that I could get hired, and a few months later, he hired me. I started in um, uh, July of 1966. And shortly after, uh, Leroy came back from the Army is when we started working together in uh, 68. That's how I got here. And had you spent much time in high school? No, I think that maybe sometime in high school, I may have visited Huntsville. But, okay. uh, but you didn't have as many I, strong I, no, I, had, I didn't know anything about Huntsville. Mm -hmm. But you, you knew that you loved normal, at least. Yes. <laughs> yes. I, I knew that. And, and, and I also knew that the Clarks, Mingo Clark and his wife, Lou Clark, mm -hmm. were in Huntsville. Mm -hmm. I also knew that Mr. Horace Fields, who was the principal at Council High School, was here. He, he was from Troy as well. Mm -hmm. And his wife, Mrs. Esther Fields, was my third grade teacher in Troy. So I felt extremely blessed and that, that the good Lord had, had placed me here. So, in the right place. In the, in the right place. So, 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 so I was just happy to, to be here. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that was even before I was even thinking about minute girl. I'm just, I'm just happy to be here. <laughs> but, but when I met John, uh, and I don't know if he even remembers this, but I met him over on, on Turf and Belafonte in around 1968 or so. Uh, and we were just standing out there talking. And I think we started talking about television <laughs> or something. But we were just talking. And, and we wind up talking. Uh, at Redstone, and and John was uh, quite a bit much more mature, <laughs> and he was far more advanced in the area of civil rights mm. than than I. Uh, he had a little notebook that he kept. Uh, Articles from the Atlanta uh, Constitution. Uh -huh. And he would show it to me every once in a while. And we'd get into discussions. And sometimes those discussions turned into real, genuine, uh, critical discussions. Mm -hmm. uh, but he, but he, had, he had a feel for it. And, and I knew. When, when he came to call on me, uh, I, I, was, I was in for something. Mm -hmm. and, and we started working together on, on stuff. Uh, and, and I don't quite remember all the ins and outs, but Luther Adams wanted us to succeed and he wanted equal opportunity to succeed. And he established a position, the first one in, in the uh, Department of Army, and it was called the Equal Employment Opportunity Action Officer. And it was established in the Civilian Personnel Office and he appointed John to the position. And John started making progress, and and he wanted he wanted John to to be the sports person for the civilian personnel office on equal employment opportunity. Mm -hmm. I still had programs that I was doing, but he wanted John to have have his finger on it. And and I remember around 1970 
we were planning for the big reduction in force at Redstone. And, and John called my name again. He said, hey, look here, I've been assigned to go downtown to the First Missionary Baptist Church, downtown Church Street, and to explain to the black community the reduction in force procedures. And I think you need to go with me. <laughs> Let me ask, a, let me interrupt and ask a question. What were some of the things that you were charged to do as Equal Employment Opportunity Officer in order to bring on the first African Americans to Redstone? Were there any specific things that... that uh, well, yes. Um, rather than specific things, let me tell you how that came about. Okay. Because, you know, we're talking about 1968, 69, and uh, the fact that there was just no opportunity whatsoever for black folk... Uh, with college degrees to get meaningful employment out here. <clears throat> uh, pick up on what Leroy said there, uh, Luther Adams, for a number of reasons, um, decided and was under the influence that since he was one of the senior people out here regarding hiring, who got hired and who got fired, and who got promoted, that it was incumbent upon him to do something about that. And so when he brought me on after Leroy went to the Army, um, he just kind of said, um, you decide what we need to do out here. And um, come back and let's discuss it and we'll figure out how to do it. That's a, that's a, that's a summary of what happened. So you had the, you had so the, we had to, you know, flexibility. we had to create, create, but you know, first of all, to identify what the problems were out here. Mm -hmm. Was it that, that people were being discriminated against? was the people that uh, were not uh, uh, career-wise, uh, employment-wise, situated in the right positions in order to be recognized with potential and et cetera. Just what, what were the problems? Mm -hmm. Are were people, black folk, applying for jobs? Are that they not have qualifications? To look, try to look at all of that and come forward with uh, what ought to be done. Mm -hmm. What did you find? What, oh. what was the root of the problem? Uh, so. Three categories. Uh, some of us remember when there was the carriage inn downtown, the first mm -hmm. big hotel, I guess, downtown, yeah. yeah. Um, that was a Department of Defense team that came through here in 1968 doing the one and only worldwide tour of assessing the Department of Defense's activity regarding black people in the communities, wherever they were, all the way over, all the way over around the country. And they came here and they met in carriage inn. And they, uh, we had advance notice that they did not want to meet with anybody off the arsenal, including the commander general. They wanted to talk to the community leaders. People like Dr. Morrison, Alabama a &M, Mr. O'Neill, uh, many of the business leaders. However, the commanding general here, Charlie Ack, at the time said, I run the post. If there's something going on in the post, I don't know about it. I'm the one who can do something about it, so I'm going. Uh, keeping in mind, I was just a year and a half employed out here. I was just an intern. But my friend Claude Martin, <clears throat> who was one of the ones to be invited to the meeting, yeah, he told me, I want you to go because you're in a strategic position there in the personnel office. And I happen to know that Luther Adams put you there for a reason. And this will be part of your maturation, if you will. So, uh, and he also brought another man in by the name of Jesse Draper from the Draper Brothers. You know, they were, they were labor leaders, they were preachers, mm -hmm. and et cetera, in this community. He brought him in because Mr. Draper had a story to tell that Claude knew. Mm -hmm and knew yeah. that Mr. Draper would tell it. Yeah. And so we were there and uh, the meeting started and um, obviously the academic and, and spiritual leaders of this community didn't really know what the issues were to discuss with this team out of Washington. Uh, they just knew that they hadn't been successful in breaking the color barrier out here. So Mr. Draper spoke up, and I'm gonna <coughs> summarize this because this is very important. Mr. Draper spoke up and apologized for being there. Mr. Draper was a laborer, Debbie G. Four, the lowest grade on the arsenal. And uh, he spoke up and he says, I cannot, you, you gentlemen from, from, from Pentagon cannot do anything for us down here. He's only the man uh, that's commander sitting right up here, so I'm gonna talk to him. And he said, I came here 25 years ago, a white guy, and I laid down our plow at being in the army at the same time 25 years ago over on Sand Mountain. We came in and we both got a job as a laborer. 
So 25 years later, he's a GS-13 supervisor of a big directorate, and I'm still a laborer. And he says, I have gotten a stack of best qualified but never selected by that high. And he says, General, I want you to explain to me how that can be on your post. So that struck a nerve with the commander. Next morning when I got to work, oh, Mr. O'Neill spoke up and said, General, we'd like to introduce you to this man sitting, this young man sitting behind you. I was sitting there trembling in my books, obviously. <laughs> said, because I want you to rely on him to help you understand what ought to be done. Next morning, I got to work at 7 o'clock. Personnel director, Luther Adams, were pacing in front of that in the building waiting on me to get there because the general called them that night and said, I want all of y'all to be in my office next morning because we got to straighten this stuff out out here. So from that, uh, the general authorized Luther Adams and I to determine what needed to be done, who was responsible for it, getting done, meaning his colonel right here, and uh, let's start getting it done. That's how that the framework was set for movement to start out here. So we had people out here, as you know, that uh, had college degrees, had been here in clerical jobs, low-level technician jobs. We had people with a lot of potential out here, not college degrees, but a lot of potential still in laboring jobs, still in low-level clerical jobs. So we put together a list and determined all these people's qualifications, cared to the general, and the colonel's in charge of the organization, and then he held them accountable for promoting the people immediately that had full qualification, like Mr. Draper. And for the ones that had a lot of potential, but lacked a little bit more, getting them in some school or training program. So in record time, they could be eligible for a promotion. And the one that didn't have any of that, sit down and figure out what needs to be done for them to start gaining experience. So that was, that was, that was the beginning, the beginning, the beginning of everything that started happening. And it was amazing what happened. In three years' time, what I think I shared with you, uh, Dr. Morrison wrote, the four-star commander of Army Material Command, which is right down the headquarters right down the road. It used to be in Washington. Dr. Morrison wrote it and said, normally I don't write people at your level. He said, but I want you to know that in the last three and a half years, after not having any of my graduates being employed in career positions at that Redstone, that I'm advised that 71 in the last three and a half years have been hired and placed in career jobs out there at Redstone. So these are 71 Alabama A&M. 71 yeah. Alabama A&M graduates. Yeah. So that was kind of the quick turnaround when we got started. Okay. And, 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 and one reason that that happened is, is because we found something uh, in, within the civil service system that called the rule of three, and that's how selections were made. You get a list of names and you had to select from the top three well, you could go through that process and you could just uh, rule out uh, a lot of people. Mm -hmm. uh, but the system changed during that time and, and, and there were exceptions made. Uh, so the Army implemented a, a process uh, called uh, on-the-spot recruitment up to 10%. If you were in the upper 10% of your graduating class, you could be employed without regard to that, that uh, Federal Service entrance exam that I kept failing. <laughs> and, and, and you could be hired. And that's how people start yeah. receiving appointments. And, and the recruiters came to Alabama A&M and Alabama A&M graduates start coming, not, not just to, to Redstone Arsenal, but they were going to St. Louis and other Armored Material Command uh, activities. Uh, but of course, many of them wanted to come right back to, to Huntsville. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the significance of what Lady Rogers just said was, we started, we developed under Luther Adams' permission and guys, we developed those kind of policies here, but <coughs> immediately, immediately, the Department mm -hmm. of Army whole, uh, Army wide uh, developed those same policies based on what they were where we were doing here, and then it became standard practice all of the Army, all of the Defense Department, and then the Civil Service Commission, OPM at that time, changed its own policy to accommodate that. So that was the effect, yeah. in just a short period of time, of what we were able to do here, 
and, and in the personnel system yeah. with the regs, because you know regs are like uh, in the laws, it's kind of flexible. If you're in charge, you can, you can shave it a little bit one way or the other. So that's the impact. Yeah. of what we started here in a short period of time. It so, went Army-wide, defense-wide. So Redstone really was the first place oh, yeah. there was this yeah. change in, in promotion internally and then also this Processes and, 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 and reinterpretation of something that was in the, in the reg, very loose, that could be interpreted to, but, but, to uh, be in a positive aspect. You know, I, I think because of those discussions that we had in the personal office, you know, with John, John book of articles and those discussions that became wide ranging critical analysis of, of what we call the system. You know, we, we start thinking, you know, what can we do? And, and, and we start figuring out ways mm -hmm. and looking at the civil service system and how, how did people get hired? Uh, and what, what was used to get people into the federal system? And, and pretty soon, Redstone got the reputation that if it didn't happen at Redstone, it didn't happen. Uh, if it can happen at Redstone, it can happen anywhere. Yeah, that was a challenge. Commanders the around the country. Yeah. Uh, begin to hear and know about Redstone. Yeah. And they start talking to their major leaders and say, if it can happen at Redstone, why can't it happen? Why can't it happen here? Yeah. Uh, at Tank Automotive Command in Detroit. Yeah. At the Communications Command in New Jersey. Yeah. Why is it can't happen? If it can happen in Redstone in yeah. the 60s in Alabama, why is it it can't happen here in my place? So that was the spirit of it and the challenge that went forward. That's it. And and, and, and it kept building and, and building. And, and, and Luther Adams was uh, uh, one who, who just kept building on, on, on its blocks and, and programs. And said, okay, now what about, okay, we got the college graduates squared away. Well, what about those who are not college graduates? How do they? Make it. Mr. Jesse Draper. Yes. Yeah. Laborers right across yes. the street yes. over here. Okay. Okay. So, well, uh, what well, Jesse Draper said, how do you expect me to make it if you don't let me fool with the equipment? Mm -hmm. yeah. So, there was a, a, a program that, that another one of those that I got stuck, I got <laughs> stuck with. The program. I, I shouldn't say, I shouldn't say stuff. I, I got a chance to. Uh, to coordinate, yes. <laughs> okay, and that was the that was the worker trainee program. Mm -hmm. Just come in as GS one, lowest level, and develop a training program to move them up. And here's here's a success story. Uh, last week, last Saturday, in fact, I was at uh, a, a celebration of a person's 100th birthday. Uh, at Progressive Union. She was a charter member of Progressive Union. And, and I was moving around, got stopped. And the person said to me, I know you. I said, you do? Yeah. Uh, I knew you when I was a student aide. I said, yeah. And I was a worker trainee. I said, yeah. I said, well, while you were a worker trainee, what did you do? Did you try to get at the co-op program while you were a worker trainee? No, I, I, I went on to school, got my degree, and I moved through the ranks, and, and I kept up with my professional certification. And now, after 37 years, time passes, I tell you. After 37 years, I'm retiring as a GS-14. I said, goodness gracious. I, I said, wow. Let me add a comment on that worker training that he developed here. It was, it, 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 after really it caught on at the Department of Army level and stopped yeah. putting policies out and regulations, they named it Upper Mobility Program. Yeah. Official program, yeah. Upper Mobility. Leroy yeah. started here. Yeah. Now, and what year was that you got the Christian Award? 
the Kushnik war. This, this is part of Leroy, part of because of that, uh, 19, and the significance of that, because it, it was uh, adopted yeah. federal service wide. Leroy received, oh. must have been in the 80s, yeah, I brought, what is I, called the Kushnick John, Award. John called me, 1980. Now, the significance, is, the significance is, that's the highest award a civilian in the personnel program the Department of Army can get. Yeah. Okay? Normally, normally, only the elite in Washington get it. Yeah. Senior level elites get it. Leroy got it because of that upper mobility program he yeah. developed right here. Yeah. Kushnick Award. Yeah. That, you know, this this is the one I uh, kind of hold on to. You know, <laughs> the other one because it's it's, it's kind of special that uh, that you have to you have to have you have to have evidence. I was going to ask you a question since since Redstone and the Army seem to be very uh, proactive in in bringing on uh, people of color during that time. Did you find that 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 situation and what you were doing influenced what was going on in the city of Huntsville with businesses. Uh, with yes, city yes, absolutely. The, the, another piece of mine, little artifact. <laughs> this, one. I, I keep this. One. Uh, it's it's B R A C ninety one. This old book, nothing in it. It stands for Base Realignment and Closure. Uh, that when the Army decides to, to consolidate for efficiency purposes, uh, close some bases, consolidate functions, missions and functions, they have to look for efficiencies and where to best locate those missions and functions. Redstone has been very fortunate. And I keep this, Bright 91. We thought we were on a good road, but we didn't win in Bright 91. We won something, but not the big portion. Okay. We thought we were going to become the big Mike Tom in 91, but we didn't. But then in 93, we won. 93. We won in 95, we won in 97, and then we won AMC moving here. Because, because the community, the community said, Huntsville is a place to be. And, and there, there is a partnership between the Huntsville community and Redstone Arsenal. Not, not just Huntsville itself, but the whole Tennessee Valley. And I have gone to, to these bright teen uh, adventures, I say, because some of them have been really adventures, uh, to talk about relocating to Redstone Arsenal, relocating to Alabama, and I could tell you stories of talking to people in California to come to Alabama. <laughs> said, are you kidding me? <laughs> oh, take me over in a corner. <laughs> <laughs> well, the business climate uh, in Huntsville was set back even before Leroy and I started here. When uh, Milton Cummings, one of the most uh, Richard's me in, 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 in Huntsville at the time, uh, decided that um, in order for, to attract businesses to Alabama, Huntsville, just getting ready to bring in new programs, et cetera, he formed this uh, organization called Association of Huntsville Area Contractors right. Right. Uh, and brought in early, early, early 60s and brought in a man named Elsie McMillan mm -hmm. who was the uh, registrar of Texas, I mean, Prairie View in the university and composed of the council that he put together was the CEO of every contractor that had gotten to Huntsville, uh, like Boeing, uh, like GE, and et cetera. Because Milton said, if we are to bring money into Huntsville through you all, 
we got to establish a climate that will demonstrate to the rest of the country and even the world, if foreign countries come in here, that Huntsville is changing as a friendly place. It just so happened that Redstone was the one to be that agent, which he designated. But the, but, but, but the business leaders, I, I heard this tale this morning about that time that uh, we only had two hotels, I think, in Huntsville mm -hmm. at the time, Carriage Inn and King's Inn. King's Inn was owned by Wood Anderson, or Wood Anderson Ford. And shortly after that meeting down at Carriage Inn, Woody Anderson told this tale, I understand, from one of the old leaders here, that he got a call from that general the next day and said, I hear that the black engineers and others that were bringing in here TDY have to go to boarding houses because you all will not accommodate them. And I'm telling you, if you don't integrate immediately, then we're going to stop spending money. And I understand that when Anderson changed the policy and the rest is history in regard, regard to public accommodations in Oslo. So, so Redstone yeah. could be seen as an influencer oh, in yeah. the, um, probably the successful and the um, I won't say quick, but aggressive uh, integration here in Huntsville, both in the local community as well as an employment on Redstone, that Redstone was a catalyst. Just one other quick note in regard to the influence back at that time. Uh, Butler High School, as you recall, I think it was integrated in maybe 1966, 68, something like that. And um, one year after it integrated, which had been 69, they had a racial unrest in Butler High School. And I happened to be in the IG's office the, moment, the, the day he got the call and said that from the MP said, we're going over to Butler and get all the students from uh, out on Arsenal uh, and bring them back because they got, they got big racial problems over there. The next day, the commander at that time called the mayor and the city council and said, we want an emergency meeting. He went down there to talk about this. And I understand he was told by the PAO director, public affairs director here, who's his confidant, that you go down there and it's three o'clock in the afternoon and the sun is gonna be shining through this window here and you sit right in front of that window. This is a true story. And you tilt your shoulders so the sun will shine off your stars and you tell them that if you all don't straighten out this racial situation in your school, then I'm gonna recommend the Army we take Huntsville out, uh, rest on Arsenal out of Huntsville. Obviously, you didn't have no problem racial integration in Huntsville. That was the influence of the money on the climate. Can you um, identify, either of you, identify several other leaders like the commanding general at that time who were some of the influencers? Uh, on Arsenal and off Arsenal. Only Arsenal and off the Arsenal. Well, <laughs> one man was Bill Henry. Bill Henry and Luther Adams came here at the University of Alabama the same year, which I think was 1948, something like that. And they were the most powerful men on the Arsenal here. And uh, Mr. Draper's case came up, and they wanted to make a show of moving him up. But Bill Henry and his people did not select him again. Another one of those slips, going on top of all those slips for 25 years. So Luther called Bill Henry and cared myself and his director of recruitment down to Bill Henry's office. Now, I like to tell this tale because of drama here. Bill Henry was a very powerful man out here, post engineer like the mayor of this whole place. He had a long table, uh, like one of those country saloons, mm -hmm. shiny. He sit, Luther and myself and Jim Blackman on one end, and he and his crew sit on the other end. And Bill Henry said to Luther, he said, Luther, you and I have been knowing each other forever from the University of Alabama. I don't want you to come down there telling me about any of this slavery stuff, all of this segregation, all like that. I had nothing to do with that. And don't come down here with that. So Luther, long pause, obviously I'm sitting here shaking. I <laughs> just got here, got a wife and a new baby, about to lose my job. So Luther said, Bill, yes, you're right. He said, but we are just as, so we are, whatever the situation is here, we've helped create it over the last 25 years. And he says, it's two powerful white men not only at this arsenal, but in this town, because we're both deacons on the First Baptist Church. He said, if we don't do something to change this that we've created, we are just, we're going to be just as guilty 
as the people, our people, had created 150 years ago. Long pause in the room. Bill Henry says, Luther, you got that paper? That's why Mr. Draper had been, had not been selected again after 25 years. Luther slit the paper down that bar. I mean, it's a scene right out of the movies, mm -hmm. bar. Bill Henry got it, struck through the young white boy's name that had been selected, put Mr. Draper's name in there, and slid it back up the bar. And he said, you boys come back and see us sometime. Now, <laughs> the whole arsenal, knowing that that showdown was happening, was waiting to see who was going to blink. Mm -hmm. If Luther had blinked, then who knows whether the arson would ever change. But Bill Henry, being, remember Luther said, big deacon, okay, we have a moral responsibility here because we're in charge to start changing this and make it, and we're going to start right here with this, with this one WG4, and that changed a lot. That changed the life. That was a memorable, yeah. memorable time. I, yeah. I've told that tale across the army, crossing around the world for 40 years. But, but, but one thing, one thing you have to remember: uh, Luther Adams was a tall man. He, he's tall, and his uh, voice was a, a commanding voice. And when I came. To Redstone, uh, he he had a presence, and he wanted to know when I was going to lunch in his in his domain up there. And when I went to lunch, he went to lunch, and he came where I was and sat down. Wonder why, and it, you know his, his message simply was that he belonged here, and I want him here. If you got a problem with that, come see. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, you can appreciate that was important because that was changing culture, yes. huh? Yes. That was overturning three hundred years of certain cultures and relationships. And he yeah. was a leader and he wanted to. The significant yeah. thing about this father is that he wasn't operating as a result of a, of a court decision no. or a, 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 a advocacy group demonstrating. Oh. He was operating on his own because yeah. he said, this is what we're in charge. And if we don't do it, then we're just yeah. guilty. He, he was thinking that this is the right thing to do. The right thing to do, and I determine what the right is. And it's the right thing to do. Can you all, either of you, um, as we close up, um, identify any things that you would want young people to remember today? Any any kind of advice or um, encouragement or um, anecdotes from your time starting uh -huh. at Redstone that you would want to pass on to young people today? Well. My, my advice was uh, heed the advice given to you, even though you might not understand it at first. Now, uh, John Nelson uh, said to me, uh, look here, there's a, a job in the Pentagon I said, John, I don't want to come to Pentagon. He said, man, you, it's, it's a good job. I said, I, I don't want to come to the Pentagon. You keep that stuff to yourself. I don't want it. Look, you be working for Sam Ford. I don't want to work for Sam Ford. They said, it's, come. He said, just say, just say you are available. So, so I said I was available. And the job that I really wanted, I was also available, and that job was right here at Redstone Arsenal. And I did get selected for the job at Redstone that I felt so super prepared to have. And I found myself in a quandary. I found I had to take the job 
at the Pentagon. And I found myself in a room one day uh, after having studied a situation. And, and the word was, look, there's this situation in South Alabama and we need to get it fixed and we need to send somebody down there. And I found myself raising my hand saying, I'll go. And I went. And I, 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 I tell John, I, I blame him for, the, for my four and a half year exile to Fort Rucker, but that four and a half year exile allowed me to come back to Redstone. As a personnel director. As a person. As a person. First one, first black person to be the personnel director of major army activity yeah. anywhere. Okay. Yeah. Probably never been, probably hasn't been one since then, Bill, not that I know of. And what would you well, say? Um, I guess, <laughs> thinking about what would I tell my, my sons, or what did I tell them? I guess the most important thing is to always be mindful of your attitude about things. Yeah. Um, and in that regard, concentrate as much as you can early on in life and get some idea of what you want to be without being specific. What do you want to do? What do you want to be? Uh, and in your own mind, develop a plan and try to adhere to that plan forevermore. But the main thing is your attitude. Have a positive attitude. Regardless of what your peer group may say and do, et cetera, you got to have an attitude about yourself and what you want to do and figure out what it takes to get there. But keep that attitude, that positive attitude. One of the notes. I gotta tell this story, yeah, okay. Uh, in, in, in 68, I think it was, uh, Lou Adam decided that he wanted to integrate, not he didn't want to go, he did, he'd heard yeah. concerns about the fire department. Yeah. Never having a black fire department <laughs> out yeah. here and not having one in Huntsville. <laughs> he, can't, he can't tell all of them. And he told Leroy and I, uh, look around, check it out. And we, could, and we found out that there wasn't a black fireman in the state of Alabama. That even we could try to Five proselytize. We talked to Mingo Scott, who was a Mingo counselor Clark. over at Butler. Mingo Clark. 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 He referred a young man that just gotten out of the Army, was a football player, outstanding football player at Butler High School. And uh, good, good, good attitude, good everything. So when they decided to bring him in for an interview to try to hire him, <laughs> it is. Luther didn't send him through the regular process. He turned him over to Leroy and I. <laughs> and he said, at the end of the day, I want this young man hired. Fire department. At the end of the day, he was hired. Now the thing, the, what I want to say here is, 30 years later, hmm. he retired as assistant fire chief out here. Not a single fireman in Alabama when he was hired here. Really? And that was all, there were all kinds of reasons offered, including the fire chief himself. Oh, uh, well, you know, blacks can't do the job. I bring him on, y'all gonna force him on if you want to. 30 years later, he retired as assistant fire chief out here. Yeah. Hale is one of the greatest fire chiefs ever had out here. Yeah. To me, that's, that's, that, that's, one of, that's the yeah. most satisfying thing that happened to me. Yeah. Well, we thank you all for participating in the interview today and um, just compliment Well, I wanna thank you and I wanna thank you, uh, Dr. Chung, I wanna thank Kelly for arranging this, thinking about it, arranging this, because we have talked for decades about the fact that we're getting old. Our memory's <laughs> beginning to fail, we're gonna die. And what we know about the story hasn't been told That's and probably right. never would be told. So I just, mm -hmm. I just appreciate yeah. what you all are doing. And we will carry on the legacy that you've started. So <laughs> thank you so much. You know, I, I, I really, uh, I thank you, you know. Uh, when, I, when I retired uh, in 2001, it, it was a, a very emotional mm -hmm. time for me, and, um, and, 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 and sometimes it, it, it gets emotional even now, but it's, uh, 
it's a, I, I enjoyed my time uh, here. And, and John and I, I you know, I, I couldn't have planned it or scripted it, you know, to come out. Uh, and I don't know if, if I've ever had a, a, a carpool partner, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, and going through Rock Creek Park and, and the Pentagon, and, uh, to the Pentagon, living in different towns, meeting up. And sometimes John would forget to leave that park and pass. But we'll, we'll tell that story for another yeah, time. We'll, we'll have to schedule a follow-up. <laughs> yeah. I want to thank you both again for taking the time to share these stories with us. And we're so grateful for the opportunity to preserve this history and, and share it with others. And so we also are, are grateful to all of those who join us and are able to appreciate this work going forward as well. And um, looking forward to making the most of this important legacy of what's been done here on Redstone and what's been done for the city of Huntsville.